you again this evening as we continue our study in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and the prophetic books associated with the hundred years of the return from the Babylonian exile. Uh, please just excuse my voice. I know it's a little bit gravelly at the moment. I hope that you have been enjoying this um, series that we're doing. And I hope that after last week you were inspired to go and read the book of Ezra again uh, not just with an understanding of it and and possibly how it, you know the timeline of it, but I hope you were inspired by by the person of Ezra, and I hope that that uh, the Holy Spirit used that to speak to you about yourself and encourage you in your own uh, journey as as a child of God and as a leader in the church. So we're going to continue now in the book of Nehemiah. And um, so, so we're dealing with the last part of the return. Remember, we looked at the, re- the first return was Zerubbabel, where the temple was rebuilt. The second return was with Ezra, where, where the, the role of the word and the ways of God and the worship of God were established. And that was a 60 year later return. And now we're dealing with the third return, the final return, which is uh, the return that was led under Nehemiah. And um, actually, it wasn't so much that people came with him. He came back and he had this task. Now, now generally, when we think of Nehemiah and we think of the book, uh, we think of leader and we think of building project. And so I'd like to just look at the three different areas in the book, for me anyway. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're pretty much just going to focus this evening on, on chapters 1 to chapter 6, and you'll see why. So Nehemiah's role in Jerusalem, it seems, was about a 12-year period. From the year 445 BC to 433, it seems like he was there for that chunk of time. Then he went back to Persia for a brief moment, and then came back for a second visit, it would seem, after the year 433. So we're all familiar, number one, with his project. The project of Nehemiah was the building of the wall, or the rebuilding of the wall, which took place in 52 days. Bearing in mind he was there for 12 years, that's a very, very small uh, window, a a very small glimpse into what his role was. Uh, We we assume Nehemiah rebuilt the wall. That's just a little part of what he did. In fact, I think if you read from chapter 7 towards the end, so the first six chapters deal with the wall, which is then completed in in chapter 12 or dedicated in chapter 12. But if you read from chapter 7 onwards to the end of Nehemiah, um, it's far more about building a people. It's far more about what God was doing in the nation. It It was the... the populating and, and the building with living stones as opposed to the stones on the wall. So I think if you think of Nehemiah, you think of his project, the wall. You think of his bigger building project, really, which was to build a people, to, to build a nation and, and to, to bring a, a, a if, if Ezra brought worship, it seems like Nehemiah brought an administration to facilitate and serve that worship. But what I'd like you to focus on with me this evening, and maybe let it be the focus of your study of Nehemiah, is not his projects, neither the wall nor the people, but but to read particularly the first six chapters and learn something about the person. Um, it's funny how we, we stereotype leaders. We do that today. And we look back in the Bible and we stereotype Abraham was this and Moses was of this and David was of this and Joshua was of this. And, and somehow Nehemiah is this, I guess he's like a, a site foreman or somebody like that. Um, we don't know too much about him. It doesn't seem that he was married. In fact, some versions say that he was a eunuch. But he was this man that was working in the courts of Artaxerxes. He was the chief cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, which was a, which was a, I mean, a proper important role. Uh, so I'd like to go through, and, and as you study these chapters, you will see other points. And... Um, and, and that's what we're doing this for, that you would study and, and see these things. But the first thing I'd like to talk about uh, or just bring to your attention with regards to Nehemiah is he was a person of such deep concern for the people of Israel. So here he is in, in, in Persia. He's got, he's got a good job. He's a successful man. And, 
but, but his concern, his heart is always with his people back in Jerusalem. And so uh, chapter 1 and verse 2 uh, kind of like sums up Nehemiah's heart towards his people. It says, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. So, so here he is uh, serving the king and, and he hears news. You, 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 you've all known and you've all seen people who you're having a conversation with them, but, they, but they've got an angle that they, they want to know what's happening. Their heart is somewhere else. And, and this is Nehemiah. Although he's safe and secure here, his, here, his heart is about Jerusalem. His heart is about his people. How's it going with them? So that's the first thing we see. Now, I'm not going to uh, give you the chapters and the verses because I'd like you to, 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 as you look at this man, Nehemiah, and I trust that, that, um, that God the Father by the Holy Spirit will, will speak to you about your own person, your own devotional life, your own leadership journey, your own leadership role. That's really what I'm hoping will, will be sparked inside you. But the second thing I see with Nehemiah is, yes, he was a man of, of, of um, what do they call these days on the strengths founders? He, he was an, an executive, made things happen, but he was a man of prayer. His, his, his first response to a need you see it quite clearly, was to pray and to fast and to wait on God. And so we, we saw in, in Ezra, a man of prayer, and we see here in Nehemiah, a man of prayer. Third thing we see about Nehemiah is that he was a man of reputation. He, he had a name in the marketplace. He, he held down a responsible position. He was taken seriously by his reputation. Next, we see that, that um, he was a man of empathy. So, so when he realized what was going on in Jerusalem, when he realized the state of the people and the state of the city, it wasn't a case of um, you know, the, them and us. He, he, he identified so deeply with the, the, the pain, with the, the, the circumstances. With, he identified with the failure. He identified with the shortcoming. He didn't. He didn't compl- he, he wasn't saying, you know, look what they're doing or look what or, 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 or look what they're not doing. He was identifying with them. In fact, it's it's a very interesting thing that we see there is that Jerus- the, the people in Jerusalem, by not attending to the wall, by not attending to to uh, the full life of God and the full will of God, were being disobedient. And he identifies with their disobedient in living below the par of God, if I can put it like that. So he, he identifies deeply. Uh, friends, it's, we hear this language so often. You know, the problem with the church is this. You know, the problem with the leaders is this. You know, if they only did, who's they? He identifies completely with the people of God. The next thing uh, we see in him, again, he was a man of action, but he was a man of patience. In fact, when when you read the second chapter and he goes back and and he does this exploratory walk around Jerusalem at night, um, you see that he's a man who, who doesn't, he doesn't rush in God. There is there is a sense of gestation. There there is a sense of of the vision and the strategies and, and the things of God forming inside of him. He doesn't get ahead of what God is doing. It's a lesson for some of us. It's a lesson for me. Um, to 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 let the things of the spirit and the leadings of God gestate inside you till their right time. The possibly the most. Um, overwhelming of his 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 uh, attributes is his ability to raise a team and to lead it uh, for me one of the highlight chapters in this book is chapter three and in chapter three it talks about the building process taking place and and the key phrase in chapter three is these two little words next to just hear that next to 
It says that so-and-so is working next to this person. And this person was working next to this person. And this person was repairing next to this person. So I have one of those little phrases. I don't know if it gets you, but it gets me. He had the ability to, to sow vision. He had the ability to, to raise up some leaders. But, but he had this ability to unite a people. To, to gather a people and, and not just to gather them behind him, but to gather them to each other. They were building together. The next thing we see, or another lesson that we learn from him, is his faith. There, there, is, this, there is this deep, deep faith in, in the presence of God, the power of God, the provision of God. The prevailing of God. So he's a man of deep faith. He's also a man of tremendous courage. He, he showed courage in the face of the king. For him to approach Artaxerxes and say, you know, I, 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 I'm your cupbearer. I'm appointed by you, but, but I have a mission that God has called me. And I need some time off. And that mission, by the way, took 12 years. He, he had courage before his employer. He had courage before the king. He had courage before men who held um, basically the authority over his life. But he didn't tremble before them. He had courage. He had courage before his leaders. When his leaders were, 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 were not sure and, and, and were wavering, he had courage. He had courage in front of his people. When his people got negative, when his people uh, were, were moaning and groaning, he had courage. He had courage in the face of, of overt opposition. Now, I don't need to recover the opposition because we looked at that last week, but there was opposition from without. Remember, we saw that, uh, the the. The, there were names, the names of the guys mentioned, I can't remember their names, but, but the guys were mentioned who were overtly opposing what he was doing. They, they started off by, by ridiculing, by, by questioning, asking those questions that, that belittle, that demean, that, that cause you to lose courage. Uh, eventually they were intimidating, eventually they were threatening his life. They tried everything they could to discourage him, but he remained full of courage against the overt, the outward opposition. But I think that the harder opposition was the opposition that came um, from his own people and their discouragement. And, and, and the one verse says that they kept on repeating. You, you know when somebody brings you, the, you, you know there's a problem, you know there's a challenge, Somebody brings you that thing and, and you already know, but they have to repeat it over and over and over again. He put up with that. And so he, he was a man of, of tremendous courage against the opposition. And then lastly, and you will find other points, but just for the sake of my sharing with you tonight, the last thing that really gets me about Nehemiah is his concern for the poor. Now, you'll read, I think it's in chapter 6, that, uh, sorry, chapter 5, that economically, it was a terrible time uh, that the rebuilding of the wall took place. And, and basically, rich Jews were selling poor Jews. Uh, they had got themselves locked into financial contracts, and, and there was something horrific taking place. And, and you read the way Nehemiah deals with it. He, 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 he not only sorts out um, the, the kind of labor relations and, and this, this horrific thing of, of Jews being sold as slaves to pay their debts, but um, his, his own generosity, you'll read it in chapter 5, his own generosity, uh, it's pretty relevant, his own pay cut. His, his own self-sacrifice of those things that he was entitled to as, as a governor. His, his, his paycheck, his, his menu, his, his daily menu, the, the stuff that he was entitled to. He, he, didn't, he didn't, not only did he not abuse it, he didn't use it. And he, he, uh, he maintained this really high regard and high concern 
particularly for the poor. So that's some of the things we learn about this person of Nehemiah in the first six chapters. And then from chapter 7 onwards, it's, it's really about the, the building of the people, the building of this administration. And, um, and then you'll see that in chapter 13, he returns back to Persia, and then he hears of issues again, and he returns again in about 433. To, and some of the things that he's put in place have slipped, and he, and he just goes in again and, and reestablishes the ways and the will uh, of God amongst the people. So I hope that um, this, this little glimpse we've had into Nehemiah re- really inspires you, uh, firstly, in your own relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I, I pray that as we've looked at these examples, you would, you would know God more, you would seek God more, you would love God more. Um, but I pray that this just sheds light on your own journey in God, and particularly your leadership journey. And maybe against the backdrop of Nehemiah, you do a little bit of an audit on your own on your own person. We'll join you now for a discussion. Thank you so much.